I'm Bruce Apar, and you're watching Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog is brought to you by Chase Media Group, provider of multimedia marketing solutions for an omnichannel marketplace, and also publisher of The Penny Saver. And we always like to thank our CEO, Carla Chase, and my occasional co-host, Frank J. Rich, for producing the show and bringing us to you not only on TV, but through YouTube as well. And you can search for all the previous Frank Talks with Bruce the Blogs on YouTube by entering Townlink TV or Bruce the Blog and all of the shows will come up and we like to bring you interesting people in the community who are doing things that you may be aware of or you may not be aware of but are certainly worth uh, our talking about for at least 30 minutes and we can always have them come back uh, and our guest on this show is uh, a young man who is making quite a name for himself in these parts and has produced some really interesting and worthwhile uh, documentary film work, and that is Sean Gallagher. Welcome, Sean. Thank you for uh, having me. Uh, Sean is from Yorktown, and he now lives in Albany, but also <laughs> works in Pleasantville at the Jacob Burns Film Center. Um, and you know, it occurred to me, Sean, uh, we, we just met today, yes. but, uh, you know, six degrees of separation. It occurred to me with th what we're going to be talking about today and how many points of contact, uh, indirectly, so to speak, you and I actually have. I'm just going to run them down uh, because it, it really is uh, interesting. Of course, I know your mom, Maria, <laughs> who had been, um, I'm going back now 11 years, the superintendent of the Yorktown Parks and Recreation Department. Yeah. And when uh, the Parks and Rec Commission and the town uh, very generously and uh, kindly named a field in Yorktown for our late son, Harrison, the Harrison April Field of Dreams. Your mom uh, was extremely supportive, and of course, we've never forgotten it. And every time, I don't see her as much, but every time I see her, I, I get a very warm feeling, and we still have a really nice relationship. So there's that. And then, of course, you went to Oneonta. And we're going to be talking about the documentary you made uh, relating to Oneonta. And my daughter, Alyssa, <laughs> graduated from Oneonta. Yeah. Um, and uh, the other documentary we'll be talking about today, about the late Justin Veach uh, and his dad, Jeff Veach, and the Justin Veach Fund. Of course, we know the Veaches from uh, also living in Yorktown, and we share the extremely uh, extreme misfortune of having both lost children. Uh, and he does great work, Jeff Veach, with his foundation, as we'll hear. And we have a foundation. And then something I just realized when I was looking at your bio and your website, which, by the way, is great website name. <laughs> Sean has a website dot com. It sticks uh, in your brain. That's, you know, creative people like you come up with things like that. <laughs> um, but anyhow, so you did a documentary on Jay Siegel of the Tokens. Yes. Uh, famous to my generation. For the lion sleeps tonight, and I think that the documentary actually is called Weem Away. Yes, right? Weem Away. Oh, well, guess who performed at my high school senior prom? <laughs> <laughs> so I said the that, com that completes the six degrees of <laughs> separation. That I said, wow, they did a documentary on the band that performed at my high school prom. That, yeah, he's a song. great guy too. Jay, yeah, yeah, still singing today. I know. I, I've seen him on those PBS. Uh, specials the uh, and I said this guy's voice is <laughs> it's, uh, it's amazing yeah still in the same uh, uh, key that yeah, he used right, to sing yeah, when he was in high school it's yeah. crazy um, and it's interesting uh, I hadn't thought about this till this moment but you know the way that Weemaway 
you know, all these years later, 50 years later, it uh, sticks in your head, you know, that we, we, uh, we uh, and we were just talking about uh, the late Justin Veach, who was a high school, he was a senior at the time, or the, was he was starting his senior, senior year, year uh, in 08, I think it was, yeah. right, at Yorktown High School, uh, an extremely gifted musician, and even more than a musician, um, you know, the way his production uh, capabilities, mixing Absolutely. music, you know, it, it's one thing to write music as well as he did, perform it as well as he did, but talk about a triple threat, to, to go into a studio or to have your own equipment in your basement and to mix music like that, I mean, that's just off the charts. Right, um, and multi-instruments. And, and right, play all those instruments. Yeah. So, uh, needless to say, it's a great tragedy uh, when any child uh, leaves us the way Justin did. Um, and, and when somebody has his gifts, it's just, you know, you, it leaves you speechless. Um, but the one song that, uh, on the documentary, we hear a lot about, and, uh, it's called ESRT, page 14, right? Correct. Uh, and it has a very concise lyric, um, uh, and I can't stay away because, because you're a radio, a radio wave, wave and you always seem to be transmitting, transmitting to, to my, my brain. brain. And he keeps repeating that lyric uh, throughout the song, and not unlike Weem Away in a funny, in a funny way, mm -hmm. um, once you hear that song, or every time you hear it, like I just did on the way to the studio, it... it it stays in your brain, Absolutely. which is, I guess, was part of his message. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think he was talking about uh, his inspiration. Don't you like how how a lot of uh, creative people or people who write music, let's say, it just it just appears in their head, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that seems to be what he's saying. Yeah, and that's always been a favorite thing of me was is to try to figure out what Justin was trying to say in all of his lyrics. Uh, obviously, we couldn't interview Justin, unfortunately, for this. Uh, for this film, uh, so it is kind of fun to try to interpret like maybe this is what he was thinking when he wrote this. Maybe that was the inspiration for this song. Right. And now, did you know him in high school? But she was several years ahead of him. Yes. Right? Um, Justin was just another friendly face. Right. Uh, in the hallways and also in the local punk rock scene. Right. Uh, you Which know, you, we, were you involved in that? Um, just a fan of the music. Yeah. Uh, all my friends were playing in the bands and that. Um, right. It was a really tight knit group community though. Um, right. You know, parents sure were nervous dropping us off at these really sketchy looking bars for these shows, but really what was inside was this really tight knit community. Uh, everyone looked out for each other. Um, everyone respected each other. There was no bully in there. Um, right. So it's, it's kind of fascinating sometimes, and, and I talk about this with this film, is sometimes people have these ideas that these certain communities are actually the dangerous things for teenagers, but they're actually the ones that, that are, are healthy and safe for them. And for J Justin, uh, the punk rock community was a safe thing for him. That's right. where he was straight edge. Right. And also the skateboarding community he was a part of, those were actually the friends of his that were straight edge and were doing healthy decisions. Right, and there is uh, in Yorktown now a skate park, Patriot yep. Park. Um, Which Justin actually uh, was, was one of the starters of that petition. I know, and actually they should name it for him. I mean, I, I definitely feel that way. Uh, mm -hmm. As somebody, again, who's been very fortunate in that regard with a field name for our son, exactly. I mean, they should name that park for Justin Veach, um, in any case. Um, and when did you first get interested yourself in filmmaking, and uh, was that in high school as well? Or? You know, you try to think about that. You know, it, there was always the picking up the camera, making silly videos with friends. Uh, my senior year at the high school, uh, they were offering a TV production class, and I took right. that. And at the time, I didn't think I was taking it like for very seriously. But now, looking back on it, I was very interested and very passionate about that class. And was, um, wasn't that, by the way, just as an aside, mm -hmm. was, was that Mr. Waxler? That was. Yeah, Mr. I remember Waxler, Mark yes. Waxler was. He was uh, Harrison's English teacher. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he was actually learning along with us at the right, time. Right. Uh, it was his first time taking the class. So that actually excited me, having a teacher that was learn had the same learning curve as us, so he learned along with us. Um, and then when I got to college, I was a mass communications major at SUNY Oneana. Right. And uh, that's really where I started realizing, um, you know, it wasn't necessarily filmmaking at first, it was storytelling at first. Right. That was what my passion was. Right. Uh, when I got to SUNY Oneana, the first thing I was doing, uh, I was involved on their uh, slam poetry team. Uh, SUNY oh, Oneana right. um, was known nationally for their team. We would always make final stage there. Um, so I became 
a part of that group. But what I realized was a lot of people write personal stuff um, in, in that kind of thing. I was writing about other people's stories, and that kind of came along with documentary filmmaking. Right. Uh, once I took a documentary studies class, I was realized, oh, this is actually the form I would really love to tell stories through. And it's really journalism. I mean, it's really visual journalism. When I watched uh, two of your documentaries, they're not your only ones, but the most recent ones, uh, uh, Brothers of the Blacklist and Whispering Spirits, uh, I'm not surprised that you said your interest originated uh, from storytelling mm. because you tell great stories, you really you. do. And as a director, one of the things I really admired about your style and your work is that um, you don't impose yourself on mm. the story. I mean, you know, that's one of the things they say about a great documentary filmmaker is that the, the story is compelling um, and it's... Uh, lucid, you know, you really understand what's going on, um, but it's almost like it tells itself, like the story, and I think that's one of the best compliments anybody could pay a documentary filmmaker like yourself, that somehow you manage to keep yourself at a distance, but you're obviously orchestrating the whole thing exactly. the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as I was mentioning before, you, as anybody who will watch these, uh, I think maybe will, maybe they're not conscious of it, but um, they're very, you have a very clean style and it's crisp and uh, very, pr very professional. Um, and in your work at the Jacob Burns Film Center, you're, you're fully employed there, right? Yes. And you've been a lot of things, right? You've <laughs> sort of worked your way up the ranks of projectionist <laughs> and um, other roles that you've had there as well, right? Intern, projectionist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just started off, um, I, I was living up in Albany at the time just working a cubicle job. Um, was for the sake of all definitions, I was depressed uh, working the cubicle life. Um, so I moved back <laughs> down. I moved back down state um, to really get involved in production. Started doing freelance work with uh, Patch.com, which is in the sure. local community. Yeah. Um, and that, I think that actually attributed to the clean style of, of how I edit and how I shoot my things. But um, yeah, when I got down here, I, I applied for a job at the Jacob Burns Film Center. Uh, started as a teaching assistant, oh. uh, which you know that's a job that also middle school or high schoolers and college students do. So um, you know that was a little daunting at first as someone outside of college uh, doing that. But within a week of being there, I was in their uh, equipment room. I started working there part time. Eventually became a full time projectionist, and now I work uh, on their production staff and do their editing. And so, uh, and it, you know, I'll tell you, it's really. Uh sort of makes people like me jealous that so you you know you live in Albany and you can work there virtually yeah right uh, with Edi Edi is such Bur a private thing to be right doing with Jacob Burns but they, but it's great that they give you the flexibility Absolutely. to do that and as you say the type of work you do lends itself to it and then you're at the uh, Burns in Pleasantville three days a week at the end of the week right and um, so you really have the sort of the best of both worlds in that way. Yeah, you know? I, I find it very important. I mean, the Burns is the greatest place on earth, if you ask me. Sure. And um, I find it to just be such an important place for me to be at for my own creative work. Uh, not just because the administrators there are so supportive of all of us doing our creative work, but uh, also just being around other creative people uh, motivates you sure. to, oh, to yeah. do it. They, no, they do, they do a great job at the Burns Film Center. Uh, it's really the only place of its kind. In, in this region, and my wife Elise and I are members, so mm -hmm. we love going to see uh, going to see movies there and and, and everything else that they do there. Um, and also, uh, you know, you have the good fortune, but uh, you earned it. It wasn't just handed over to you of being able to work with a very <laughs> well known <laughs> um, brand name filmmaker, namely Jonathan Demi, who uh, is sort of in residence at the Burns in his own way, right? Um, yes. And. Uh, and his name is on um, Brothers of the Blacklist, uh, Jonathan Demi Presents. I mean, that is, that is just priceless to have that. Um, I mean, and again, your, your talent has, you know, has gotten you there. I yeah. mean, he obviously recognized it. So what's it like to work with uh, Jonathan Demi? Um, Jonathan is just one of those amazing humans that you, as you said, the fortune. Uh, I really just had the fortune of, of getting to work with. Um, he is really passionate. He does his amazing Academy Award winning film like Silence of the Lambs Lambs, yep. and all these other big films, but his passion is really in social justice work. Uh, right. He's done a lot of amazing documentaries. Um, most recently, um, down in New Orleans, he went down there after Katrina and documented right. all these amazing individuals there. Um, so I've just been really fortunate with him inviting me to come to shoots. He works a lot with the Burns on his social justice work, so I've been really fortunate with um, 
going to different shoots with him, getting to see how he works a set, really see how he stays focused on a set. Um, but also in the editing room, which has been the most yeah. exciting to see how he can, as someone who doesn't actually know how to edit, how he can edit, right. how he visually just sees everything that he wants. He's a brilliant, brilliant man in that sense. And, and it's true, when you start to learn anything about filmmaking beyond being a member of the audience, <laughs> you know, beyond watching a movie, um, the importance and the primacy of editing uh, is something that is quite a revelation. I mean, how important it is and how it can save a movie or, or you know, almost ruin a movie. Uh, some years ago, uh, I had the privilege of interviewing on stage at a, uh, a, at a digital media convention, Thelma Schoonmaker, who is Martin Scorsese's oh, editor. Wow, wow. Um, and uh, we showed clips and stuff. And, you know, when you start to analyze how the editing mm -hmm really uh, affects the movie, it's, uh, it really yeah. is something. And especially that, yeah. with documentaries where you're not really, you don't know the story yet. You really don't right. know the story when you start it most of the time. Right. So you really are creating the actual bones of the story in the editing suite. Right, and just as, uh, as an interesting um, human interest aside, so to speak, uh, on a glimpse into the celebrity world, uh, you were saying how Jonathan Demi now is making a movie in a part of which is being shot in Rye um, with Meryl Streep and uh, Co uh, Diablo Cody, who wrote yeah. Juno and won an award for it, and that you met Meryl Streep. Um, yes. And, and just th that there's that little anecdote that I just think, I think it's really nice for people to hear this about somebody who is, you know, of her magnitude as a talent, um, what she's like, you know, with that little story you told. Yeah, just, uh, she, she had stopped by the Burns to uh, meet with Jonathan and, um, you know, had lunch and like any top A-list celebrity, she did the dishes, too, <laughs> afterwards. Right, yeah, Not just sure. her dishes, everyone's dishes. So. Right. <laughs> she may have polished my shoes, I don't know. <laughs> no, but that's great to hear. I yeah, mean, yeah, the, and, th and that goes along with Jonathan. It's just such a down-to-earth person, you know. And I, I think that's something I take away, too, from that, is, is to be a down-to-earth human being, right. no matter what happens. Right. Uh, and how, uh, Sean, do you find your subject matter, you know, what makes you gravitate to, I mean, in Oneonta, I, I do understand you went to school there, and the Brothers of the Blacklist um, is all about uh, what happened at SUNY Oneonta 20 or so years ago, mm -hmm. um, and with Justin Veach and Whispering Spirits, uh, you went to the same high school, and, but beyond that, beyond the circumstances or the proximity you have to the subject, what is it about these topics that says to you like this would make a really good documentary mm -hmm. um, I, I'm just a curious person is <laughs> right. usually my answer of how I find these things but um, as I start making these and looking back at them I start realizing every one I do have a connection with beforehand um, I stumbled upon it I guess um, or I knew the subject from years past uh, especially with a new one I'm working on it's just someone I've known for four years and just coincidentally we realized it's a good story to tell um, Really, I, again, I'm just, I'm just looking for a fascinating story, but it seems if I find a connection between all of them, it's, it's always someone with a story about legacy. Like, I find legacy to be important to anyone. Mm. Uh, I think you could agree, too, with, with, with Harrison. Um, it's yeah, really yeah. important for people yeah. to create a legacy. Um, I would love to have a legacy when I'm gone, too. Um, so I feel like it, with every single one of the stories I've told, I can find a connection of, it's, it's always someone that's, really passionate about leaving something behind. Jay Siegel, uh, Wimoy one. He's still performing at 70 years old. Like, <laughs> this is his legacy, and he's, he's really proud of that. Um, a lot of people walk away by that age from, from performing, but it, it's still his love. Uh, Whispering Spirits is clear, I mean, it's, it says it right there, a son, a father, their legacy. Right. That whole story is about keeping someone that you lo lose his legacy involved. Right. And with Brothers of the Blacklist, it's, it's a legacy that got swept under the rug. Uh, it's a story that should have been told, but it wasn't. It, 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 it was put in the shadows of this town, and 20 years later, uh, you could see that people were really excited that the legacy of the story is finally coming out. And we should uh, summarize, of course, yes. what Brothers of the Blacklist is all about. And I mean, starting with the sort of the top line uh, distinction is that it's the, in U.S. history, it's the longest litigated, litigated. civil rights case, right? That's yes. For 20 years. Yeah, 14 but years it's been in the courts. 14 years, yeah, and it's yeah. 1992 is when the incident took place. Correct. So if you, Sean, could just uh, 
uh, summarize what <laughs> that incident was and why it's become such a cause celebre. Sure. Um, so it happened uh, in September 1992. Uh, and what happened was an elderly woman was attacked in the middle of the night. She was staying at a home in Oneonta, New York, which was about uh, half a mile away from the SUNY Oneonta campus. And uh, all she could tell the police when they came was that the intruder in the house, um, that he was a young black man uh, with a cut on his hand uh, during the altercation because he had a knife, uh, and that he ran out the door. So the police took that and uh, had their police dog head up to the SUNY Oneonta uh, campus. And when they were there, uh, an administrator there gave them a list of the 125 black men that uh, went to school there and also where they lived. So essentially for the next three days, if you were on that list, you were stopped around town, you were asked where you were that night, you had to show your hands because of the cut on the hand. Uh, but eventually, uh, they started stopping anyone. If you were a black man, you were stopped. It didn't matter what your <laughs> age were. Eventually, they ended up stopping women, too. Uh, so really, it was just this wild goose chase. Um, in, you know, it, as the film goes on to tell, as it goes through the courts, uh, they start realizing that the woman actually never said there was a cut on the hand and the police dog actually turned away from the campus. And then also, w w also in dispute was the fact that uh, whether she actually said he was young, yes, right? Yes, yes, Which young is in your too. movie. Yeah. That's each, that was the other yeah. thing, she had right. never said that. that um, I don't think she ever had any racist intention of saying that it was a black man. She, uh, her son-in-law was a black man. Uh, she worked in the urban areas of New Jersey. Um, I do believe she saw a, a black man in the room, but she never said it was young. She never saw, said it was a cut. Um, to, to go about um, profiling like this, you need race plus one. You need race and then another identifier to justify stopping people like that. Right. So the cut on the hand was that second thing. Right, and even she, uh, if I remember correctly, later in the film, said that she was somewhat horrified by the way they went about it. Oh, not even somewhat. She was, she was very, har she horrified, absolutely yeah. believed that their civil rights were, were violated. Were violated, yeah. She was still upset that her case got lost in the midst of all this, but right. She firmly, firmly believes that the students' right. rights were violated. And in terms of having, I don't know that I'd call him a protagonist, you know, that really is not the, the right word in, in this particular uh, circumstance, but uh, the main character, so to speak, this yeah. uh, gentleman, Bo Whaley, who was a counselor. Yes. In this, and uh, he is, uh, you know, quite a human being. I mean, mm -hmm. in general, just a very impressive. His compassion jumps off the screen and, and, and his passion. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's really interesting, uh, I, I'm sure from your point of view, is the reality and the spontaneity uh, of his, at different points in the film, becoming so emotional, talking about it, saying, I can't do this anymore, and, and, and gets up and walks off the set. Numerous right? times. Yeah. The, the big joke I always had with him is, is I'm afraid to go get dinner with him because <laughs> the, the check's going to come, and he's going to be like, I can't do this, and he's going to walk out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you can see how it just affected him to the bone. Yeah, and that surprises people because, as I said, it's about 125 kids, 18-year-olds, that were being stopped. Um, but what we found was, to them, most of them were from the New York City area. They were actually used to this kind of behavior from police. Um, right. they, had been, they had been stopped for no reason before. Right. But for Bo, Bo's the one who's going down there and convincing their parents to come up to SUNY Oneonta. He's the one who's convincing people, this is a great place, this is a great way to get your uh, son out of those those situations, so he had all the he had the trust of these kids, he had the trust of these parents, and he felt like he had just let them all down. Yeah, right. I, I guess that explains why, you know, over the years when he was being interviewed by you, and then uh, was on sixty minutes. Then mm -hmm. Over the years, you, you see that he gets to the same point in his emotions where he can't even talk about it and he says that to the basically on camera he goes, I can't do this anymore yeah and how we, at one point he says that you you ruin my day the fact that you're asking me to talk about it you, you ruin my day but then again to to your credit as a as a filmmaker and an artist uh, you end with a boat uh, similarly as he talks about or you show him talking about at the beginning how you know what pains him so is how young black men are told you know, you can do, th in this country, you can do this, and you have the freedom to... You can be the president. <laughs> and, it, and, it, and at the end, he goes, and you can be the president. Mm -hmm. And, of course, this was years ago. Exactly. And he goes, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. I thought that was beautiful, the way you just... Again, you're just showing, you know, it's like what they say in, in journalism, don't tell, show. You know, mm -hmm. that's, that's sort of one of the cardinal rules of journalism. And you just show what he's saying, and it's like, wow. I mean, he's saying, it's not true you can be the president. And, well... And that's how he felt at that moment, right, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and 
also with, uh, I want to get back to, to Whispering Spirits. Absolutely. Um, uh, now, in the case of Brothers of the Blacklist, it took you how many years? Seven or eight years? To yeah, I, you know, it took years off. Yeah. Um, I, had, I, had, I had started it while I was at, at the college, so 2007 right. was when I, f that first interview with Bo Whaley is. Right. Uh, it took a couple of years off, mainly because I was up in Albany, I was just doing a cubicle job. Right. Um, I, it was just a story I knew I would eventually tell properly. Right. Uh, I had only shot one interview for that, so this was the full story. Right, and, and we should also just mention before we leave uh, the Brothers of the Blacklist as a conversation topic here, uh, that the other very impressive uh, central character is the attorney, Scott yes. Finer, who again, it, it's fascinating how you see him through the years, you know, over two different dec over two de decades that it spans. Um, and the fact that this uh, lawyer, who you could tell is very smart, uh, very dedicated, um, very fair, yes, right? very well uh, respected. Very, in yeah, you could just too. see, you know, very he used circumspect to work for and the yeah. older Cuomo's office. He used to work for right. So very well for respected. Governor Mario mm -hmm. Cuomo. Yeah, he worked for him, um, and that he did all this pro bono yeah. uh, with no fee or anything. And at the end, you say it would have cost how much money? Uh, uh, One point five million dollars. Yes, yeah. and. I was a college kid, definitely don't have that money out of college to, <laughs> to spend, so right, it, it yeah. was really him that helped push it forward. Because you got to remember, I mean, these are students that leave that place. They leave Oneana, right. they move on with their lives, right. but for Bo and, and, and the other pro professors, they're the ones still there and, and realizing that this is still important in the community. So for them and Scott to keep pushing this in the courts was so important. And that's the other uh, fascinating element of Brothers of the Blacklist, uh, the story itself. and, and speaks volumes about those students um, mm -hmm. and their their sophistication exactly. in a way, as, uh, their character, their yeah. character, and that the, the, the reparations that they wanted were an equal number of future scholarships to Oneonta, you know, as as their number, which yeah. was 125 students. Exactly. I, mean, I said, they wow. They could have had the opportunity to sue yeah. for themselves right. to make money, but they yeah. wanted it to go to future students. Right. And the other thing you have to think about, they peacefully protested. Uh, right. This is 92. 93 is the L.A. riots, so right. vi violent riots. Um, they're 18 years old, and they were right. being the, the most mature people The fact that nothing ever happened mm -hmm. um, is also quite, quite a testament. Believe it or not, Sean, we, we're, we've been here 30 minutes, which well, I find hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I wanted to see as we as we go out, as they say in TV land. Oh, this is um, Justin Veach we're listening to, and this is what we were talking about: the uh, lyric from ESRT e ESRT page fourteen. 14 yeah. Yep. Talk about sophisticated uh, you know, music production. And music. All in the basement. Yeah. Right? Unbelievable. Right. He would have been about 15, 16 when he wrote the song, probably. Yeah. Well, the other thing I wanted to mention is when, uh, first of all, you can go online and, and look up the Justin Veach Fund, which we definitely encourage you to do. Uh, and that his other song, Whispering Spirits, which yes. is the uh, eponymous song, so to speak, it's the title mm -hmm. of your documentary. I, I, for me, at least, I was telling you, Sean, when the, the beginning of that song sounds so much like John Lennon to me. Yeah. The, the, the song sounds like a Lennon song. His uh, vocal, Justin's vocal, sounds like a John Lennon song. And, I, you know, I, I, all I want to say in ending the program is I know we're going to be hearing a lot more from you and your filmmaking uh, prowess, and I think your name is going to become very familiar to people. Um, way beyond Yorktown and Albany and Pleasantville. Um, and of course, it's, as we said, it's, it's really a shame that Justin Beach, uh, um, well, obviously a tragedy that he's no longer with us, but um, his music is very much alive, as is his spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so thank and you for- And that's all from his family, right, from, and Jeffrey's work. Right, no, from, right, from Jeffrey Beach and Marina Beach and Elena, his sister, and so. Thank you for watching Frank Talks with Bruce the Blog. And we want to thank Sean Gallagher of the Jacob Burns Film Center and documentary filmmaker as well. Uh, and remember, when Bruce the Blog listens, people talk. Thank you.